Pardon? Do the posters be published? No. Uh, for, for the, uh, there was a question about posters. We're publishing only the papers. The posters, you can, there, you can uh, submit them as late as January 1st. You just have to agree that they won't be published before the meeting, but you can submit them to a journal at the same time so that uh, if you want to submit a poster and submit it for publication elsewhere, you can do that. <coughs> only the papers will be published. Lecture. This meeting will be presented by this, where, this year's winner of the Houdry Award, uh, Madame Bassin. The Houdry Award is uh, sponsored by the Catalysis Society and United Catalysts. Madame received his bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Delhi. 1958, later went on to study at the University of Indiana for a year or two, and then went on to Notre Dame, where he received his PhD with Brother Curran in 1963. From there, he went to Union Carbide, where he has been employed since 1963, <coughs> rising to the title of Corporate Fellow and Group Supervisor of Heterogeneous Catalysis. He rose to this rank in 1987. He has received several prestigious awards. He received in 1985 the Union Carbide Technical Achievement Award, 1988, the Operation Enterprise Award for uh, Automotive Pollution Control Catalysis, and finally in 1995 he is the recipient of the Eugene Houdry Award in Applied Catalysis. Madan has published 15 papers and has 14 patents. Dr. Bassin discovered, developed, and commercialized successive generations of improved selectivity ethylene oxide catalysts. He has conducted pioneering studies on the selective oxidation coupling of methane to ethylene via unsteady state catalysis. Uh, I think that uh, as of late, over a thousand papers have now been published in that area. Uh, since uh, 1982. He has also been a strong proponent of surface science techniques and catalyst char characterization. Today, the title of his talk will be Importance of Surface Science and Fundamental Studies in Heterogeneous Catalysis. Good morning. I thought that this is Wednesday, uh, the crowd was pinned down. It might be uh, easy sailing, but it looks like you all stuck by. Uh, thank you, Richard, very much for that kind introduction. Uh, ladies, uh, gentlemen, and uh, fellow Catalyst technologists, I'd like to sincerely thank the uh, selection committee of uh, the North American Catalyst Society for this uh, special recognition. I'm indeed uh, very much honored and uh, pleased to receive this uh, distinguished award named after one of the great catalyst scientists, Eugene Houdry, and of course uh, sponsored by United Catalysts. So thanks. <clears throat> At this time, uh, let's check it out. Working? It's working over uh -oh. <laughs> It was working A-OK. -okay. It's been all rehearsed. <laughs> Keep talking, but all right. <laughs> Uh, 
I was warned about this uh, uh, exotic uh, machinery, you know, and uh, we checked it out uh, earlier, and it seemed to be working. So, anyway, at this time, I'd like to. There you go. Okay. Uh, this time, I'd like to uh, acknowledge. Next slide. Um, the many folks who have uh, helped me over the years, and want to take a few moments out of this lecture to. Uh, especially recognize uh, various folks. At the top of the list are all my current and uh, past associates who have worked with me uh, in many diverse and challenging projects, including selective oxidation, alkene activation, and environmental catalysis of late. I would also like to acknowledge the surface science analytical and applied math and statistics skill centers at Union Carbide. And now, very importantly, the uh, Union Carbide management for their tremendous support over the years. Particularly noteworthy is the support from uh, three individuals. Uh, it's uh, uh, Dr. Joe Henry, George Keller, and uh, Parviz Wadia, who's my current uh, supervisor. Also, I'd like to recognize two unique individuals, Professor Gabor Samajai and Dr. Paul Palmberg of Physical Electronics, uh, my surface science gurus. I have learned a lot from them. The surface science learning have had a tremendous impact on the different catalyst systems that we have worked on and commercialized at Union Carbide. And of course, not last but not least, like to recognize my family <coughs> with uh, uh, I mean who have always shown tremendous patience with many hours away from home that I have spent enjoying chemistry at Union Carbide and sincere heartfelt thanks to my wife Anand who's here uh, daughter Madhu and son Anup for all the years of support and patience I'd like to go back to the first slide for a moment, see if it works. No? <laughs> it will. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, relate a little bit uh, on this theme that uh, Richard mentioned that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'd like to share with you several catalyst and catalytic process developments where surface science and fundamentals have played extremely important roles in the discovery, development, and diagnosis of several catalyst systems. Incidentally, today, and you will be relieved, I'm not going to talk about alkene activation, uh, which I'm sure you have heard uh, plenty, and I have taught plenty. Prior to the late 60s, it was uh, very common among scientists, engineers, to uh, refer to catalysis, and particularly heterogeneous catalysis, the one we love, uh, as either an art or a magic, right? Primary reasons behind these labels were our inability to understand the performance of poor and good catalysts, nominally having the same bulk composition. With the development of surface science in the early 70s, heterogeneous catalysis was relatively easy picking for diagnosis and improved understanding of many of these poorly understood catalyst systems. In fact, there were many sad stories of catalysts that either prematurely deactivated or essentially died and there was no known cause or relationship of that performance with observable physical or chemical properties. All of our bulk characterization techniques failed to identify the cause or causes of such activity decline. And I'm sure some of us sitting here with enough gray hairs can relate to such sad stories. Therefore, I'd like to share with you three such sad stories, which we turned into success stories at Union Carbide, where the early use of surface science was instrumental in diagnosis and enhance understanding of those systems. In addition, I would 
be uh, also describing several catalyst systems where the use of surface science and fundamental studies led to the discovery, development, and, and uh, improved understanding of those catalyst systems relating to uh, our ethylene oxide catalyst and uh, one other. Some of the surface science and fundamental characterization studies that we have found useful, and now go over to the next one, next slide, and one more and it worked, that we have found useful are covered in this slide. Primarily, uh, the uh, OJ, scanning OJ, um, and the various XPS and other spectroscopy along with ion scattering have been uh, particularly useful. Of course, complementary to that is um, uh, uh, the X-ray diffraction and the um, SEM and the like, but uh, one one cannot uh, ignore the importance of uh, kinetic studies, chemisorption, temperature program desorption, and also, very importantly, heat mass transfer studies and reaction engineering and the like. Next slide. The first of those uh, three catalyst systems that we're uh, going to be covering is uh, uh, a catalyst system which is uh, used for making methyl chlorosilanes. It employs a copper catalyst, and uh, the uh, known promoters for these reactions are uh, arsenic, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, promoters are aluminum, magnesium, and silicon, and poisons are arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and lead. It's a uh, uh, a commercial process, and we have uh, had in the uh, early days of surface science a real problem, and that is uh, some batches of catalysts will be made and we could not distinguish the performance of the good and the poor catalyst systems. But it was also an opportunity. Uh, doing the conventional analysis, which is covered here, uh, you can look at all the uh, uh, detailed analysis of both the oxidation state, cuprous, cupric, and all the other impurities, and the soluble sulfate particle size, uh, if anything, was in the other direction, yet uh, the uh, lot B was very poor in performance. Next slide. Uh, very interestingly, uh, as we uh, did the uh, OJ analysis, and uh, by the way, that took only a few hours, in, uh, even in the 70s, uh, that we were able to find out the uh, cause of the poor performance. It was found that the uh, surface lead concentration, which is a strong poison, is three times as much in the lot B, the poor catalyst. The ratio of uh, copper to lead uh, or I beg your pardon, lead to copper, or whichever way you want to look at it, were significantly different. In addition, uh, the uh, elements that I mentioned are promoters, magnesium, uh, silicon, aluminum, and the like. They were even higher in the uh, good catalyst. The concentration of lead on the top surface layer may even be several fold higher if all of the lead is enriched on the top layer. As you know, uh, OJ goes several layers deep into the surface. The good activity catalyst, uh, hence, was not only low in lead, but also had larger amounts of the promoters. The uh, larger amount of lead in the poor sample uh, on a further uh, diagnosis, it's believed to have resulted from the migration of lead to the grain boundaries of particles during a catalyst roasting step. These findings were later confirmed by ion scattering spectroscopy, uh, which is very sensitive to the surface analysis. Next, I'd like to, uh, next slide, describe another system uh, where 
surface poisoning of a commercial catalyst by iron was the uh, root cause of uh, uh, poor performance and uh, complete deactivation. <coughs> a commercial selective hydrogenation catalyst, uh, typically half a percent palladium on alumina, and large, very large surface area of gamma alumina, uh, along with uh, chromium moly as co-promoters, was found to lose most of its activity during normal operation. Uh, apparently nothing had gone wrong. It is used for uh, selectively hydrogenating diolefins in a liquid stream, and the loss in selectivity have happened and was apparently associated with a change in feedstock uh, that occurred a few days before. Next slide. Conventional analysis, um, including X-ray fluorescence, failed to show significant differences between fresh and spent catalysts. Bulk analysis showed only 0.16% iron, and th that by itself is not necessarily a poison on a 200 square meter support. We found uh, on opening up the reactor uh, on the top that uh, there was some rust particles. But on removing the rust particles, catalyst still failed to rejuvenate. The Auger analysis shown here of the uh, fresh catalyst, uh, you can see there is a palladium peaks along with the uh, uh, cobalt moly and a small amount of sulfur and chromium along with it, other impurity elements. Uh, now to the next one. OJ analysis of the spent catalyst, and by the way, I'm only showing the outer surface, uh, showed that that palladium on the normal scan, which is in uh, orange, is not even visible. But certainly at uh, uh, fairly normal scale, iron is uh, dominating the surface analysis. Uh, in addition, uh, you see the uh, co-promoters uh, are also disappeared and not visible. Um, <clears throat> these figures uh, show that uh, the spent catalyst got deactivated by a surface deposition of iron, which uh, normally was covering about 80% of the available palladium surface. The iron concentration on the inside of the pellets, when we looked at, was small, but so was the palladium uh, concentration as well. That is the way the catalyst was uh, designed for this liquid phase operation. Hence, it was concluded that iron in a dissolved form in the feedstock was the main culprit responsible for, responsible for the catalyst deactivation. And uh, next, I'd like to change over to the, the third one. And uh, <clears throat> this is, a, I think, I just uh, covered the analysis that I showed you, uh, where you can see the uh, uh, higher levels of iron in the used catalyst. Next one, I would like to cover is um, the importance of uh, surface science in uh, the uh, discovery of uh, a new rhodium catalyst system for the synthesis, uh, for the conversion of synthesis gas to C2 chemicals. Again, in the 70s, uh, and in this example, I'll share with you that the uh, rhodium iron catalyst system for the synthesis of C2 chemicals, particularly methanol, ethanol, uh, and smaller amounts of uh, acetic acid acetaldehyde, uh, was uh, discovered as a result of some early use of uh, surface science techniques. Uh, hence, I attribute uh, surface science to the discovery of the rhodium ion system uh, uh, very much. Uh, while investigating uh, the conversion of syn gas to C2 chemicals, one of my technicians uh, would uh, mention on several occasions that uh, he, he has observed increase in 
selectivity to alcohols, methanol and ethanol, as he was running chromatographs. The catalyst was just rhodium on silica gel that we had uh, worked on uh, in the uh, 74 5 time frame. And uh, depending on the reaction temperature or other conditions, this observation was repeated on several occasions. So that uh, certainly made uh, me curious and uh, said, gee, uh, we need to check this out. That's when I was associated uh, quite strongly with um, Paul Palmberg at uh, Physical Electronics. By investigating the uh, fresh and the uh, used catalyst, very quickly we found that the used catalyst was picking up iron on the surface of rhodium silica gel catalyst. And incidentally, these analyses also took only a few hours. Following these observations, we made several deliberately added iron containing rhodium silica gel catalysts, as you can see in this slide. Uh, I plotted iron content in mole fraction of the total rhodium plus iron, and the uh, cumulative product uh, efficiencies in mole percent on the y-axis. As you can see at the, on the extreme left, where zero iron, and by the way, we cleaned up the system entirely in order to get that analysis, and I uh, want to share that is another uh, very significant role of uh, surface science. We found that the sil starting silica gel always had impurities. That was uh, uh, calcium, iron, and a few other uh, alkali metals on and off. Hence, we followed a uh, oxalic acid washing procedure uh, to be sure that we have a pure rhodium silica gel system, and that's where we got the, uh, uh, the performance and selectivities for zero iron containing catalysts. Uh, as you can see, the uh, methanol, uh, which is the uh, upper uh, portion of the curve uh, and the area bounded by it, uh, increases, and so does ethanol. And that is coming at the loss of uh, acetaldehyde and acetic acid. Um, methane is uh, significant at the low fraction, but as you continue to add iron, certainly the C2 plus hydrocarbons increase. Next slide. I think I'm going to skip this one in favor of uh, this one and one more. Here we plot uh, the production rate of uh, C2 chemicals and methanol as a function of iron content. As you can see, the total C2 production on these uh, rhodium iron system is essentially constant, although you could make a small case for uh, from the zero to about 0.1 mole fraction, uh, some increase in the uh, C2 chemicals and then coming down as the iron begins to dominate the catalyst system. Uh, but the methanol production uh, increases uh, in a uh, straight line fashion up to about quarter uh, mole fraction of um, the total rhodium iron. Next one. I want to highlight here basically uh, it's the same data uh, represented differently. Uh, I want you to focus on the uh, rhodium dispersion. As iron is indeed uh, uh, overlaying on top of rhodium, that the uh, rhodium dispersion is indeed going down. And uh, now you can imagine at the higher levels, uh, when the rhodium dispersion is 14.6, that the um, uh, methane, as well as uh, the uh, higher C2 hydrocarbons, as you saw in the previous slide, begin to increase. Please note that the uh, increased uh, rates that you saw of methanol are in spite of the drop in uh, the rhodium dispersion. 
Now, where was this uh, iron coming from? Uh, the source of iron, of course, is from stainless steel material of construction used for the autoclave studies. And very likely coming is iron carbonyl formed in the inlet piping leading to the autoclave as a result of carbon monoxide attack on the stainless steel. And the discovery of uh, rhodium ion system led us to investigate uh, several other mixed metal system and certainly noteworthy was the rhodium manganese on which we have published and uh, is, uh, is the one that uh, gave order of magnitude higher rates to C2 chemicals. And uh, now, next slide. I think maybe some of you thought I'm not gonna talk about ethylene oxide, but uh, certainly am and very pleased to talk about it. I'd like to turn to the ethylene epoxidation catalyst, uh, which I've uh, spent a fair number of years these catalysts employ uh, silver on alumina as a generic composition, and that's where catalyst uh, composition similarity ends of all the different catalyst systems. As you can see, the uh, important kinetic in this reaction uh, involves not uh, hundreds of reactions that some folks were talking about in the last uh, day or so. Uh, very importantly, it's just uh, three reactions. Uh, K1 for the, uh, for the formation of ethylene oxide, K2 for the combustion of ethylene oxide, and K3 for the combustion of ethylene. As you may know, that the combustion reaction, and uh, very much uh, should be, it's very exothermic, and is term exothermic by about an order of magnitude from uh, 25 kcal for the synthesis to about 340 kcal for the combustion reactions, plus minus a few depending on E or ethylene. All the promoters and inhibitors in uh, several hundreds of patents that you have uh, uh, seen, uh, those who have been in this area, can accelerate uh, K1 K2, K3, or inhi inhibit those reactions. Here I will be sharing with you the importance of surface science and fundamental studies in the diagnosis of uh, catalysts showing different activities, though otherwise identical. And secondly, in understanding aging of a polycrystalline pure silver uh, catalyst, and thirdly, in understanding the mechanism of alkali promoter synergism that we discovered at Union Carbide, and in breaking the so-called 85.7% mechanistic efficiency limit uh, that has been well uh, published. First, turning to the uh, understanding the relative activity performance of three experimental batches, uh, Next slide. Uh, in the early days, um, we uh, had uh, three uh, experimental batches uh, represented by the, uh, the white, uh, the red, and the uh, semi. Uh, that uh, gave entirely different uh, uh, activities without any known cause. Uh, the rates were measured in uh, back-mixed uh, birdie autoclaves uh, that we use under a standard set of uh, conditions. And it was very disturbing uh, not to be able to explain why these are performing so differently. In this graph, uh, what I have summarized is the uh, surface analysis uh, basically average surface atom percent based on scans over several areas and averaging them and then the rate to ethylene oxide on the y-axis. Ethylene oxide rate was found to be, as you can see, inversely proportional to surface potassium uh, concentration. In addition, 
we were able to, next slide, uh, identify the presence of other impurity elements as well, sodium, aluminum, silicon, on the catalyst surface. These elements are the components of the catalyst support used in the manufacture of silver catalyst along with potassium. The surface concentration of these other elements when we did the extensive uh, statistical regression were found to be also inversely proportional to catalyst activity and hence directly proportional to the uh, potassium. In fact, the, uh, the slide that I shared with you previously uh, showing the inverse correlation uh, gives even a better uh, straight line performance if you include just uh, sodium along with it. Thus, the uh, performance of these uh, batches was found to be uh, as a result of uh, the varying amount of these impurity elements coming either due to processing or preparation conditions coming out of the support and later getting deposited on the surface of silver, which is the one doing all the catalysis and uh, acting as poisons. These elements, are uh, sodium potassium, are known to be promoters as well, as long as they are present in near optimum amounts. However, they are poisons in larger amounts beyond the optimum. And now I'd like to turn to uh, the importance of uh, alkali metal aggregation in aging of a pure polycrystalline silver ethylene oxide catalyst. And that's coming up in the next slide. <clears throat> a high purity uh, silver, polycrystalline silver catalyst containing small amount of sodium was found to lose substantial activity and efficiency in only 18 to 19 days of operation. As I mentioned, this catalyst is pure silver and hence contained no support. The sodium promoter was responsible for its initial high efficiency of 75 to 80 percent at about 5 to 10 percent conversion. <clears throat> the performance was evaluated in the absence of chloride, the uh, necessary gas phase promoter for commercial operation, but to keep things simple, we had done this study in the absence of gas phase uh, chloride promoter. So after 18 days, uh, losing nearly 7% uh, uh, efficiency, down to 72, uh, certainly these observations made us uh, very curious to find out what is uh, going on and what is the cause of this efficiency loss. We measured uh, silver surface area both by krypton and then also by oxygen. And if anything, the aged sample seemed to have somewhat more surface area, although uh, at very high confidence interval, I don't think uh, one could make a strong case for it. We also measured then by Auger uh, the uh, surface analysis, and uh, yes, there were small differences uh, in the used catalyst, but nominally seven atom percent sodium was found before and after use. And the small lower level in the used catalyst was not significantly different outside the noise in the data. Again, a lot of uh, different samples parts were used to uh, uh, to make sure they are randomly selected and statistically averaged. Thus, uh, simple surface analysis was unable to identify the cause of this efficiency loss. Further surface science investigation by scanning Auger microprobe revealed that the high efficiency, and that's the punchline, uh, of this uh, catalyst is due to uh, sodium promoter in a very well dispersed state and which becomes aggregated upon use. 
Next one. Next one is just the uh, SEM pictures of uh, both the uh, fresh and the used. And uh, really, there are very low feature differences. Uh, I've shown you two uh, significantly different uh, SEM photomicrographs, but uh, essentially, they are uh, no difference. It's quite typical of a polycrystalline silver. Uh, and so moving to the next one. Scanning Jose Microprobe came to the rescue. Uh, in this slide, what we're doing is uh, line scans of uh, silver, sodium, and oxygen over a 225 micron distance. And as you can see, the, uh, uh, the graph on the left, which is the high efficiency state, that the silver and sodium signal, and uh, along with oxygen, they match, correspond very nearly closely uh, to the uh, uh, intensities uh, of uh, each one of those elements. However, on the, net, on the uh, left, uh, I beg your pardon, on my right, uh, the low efficiency state, uh, you can see that uh, silver, sodium, particularly, and to some extent oxygen, uh, do not match in intensity very much at all. If anything, they are the uh, mirror image. Now, uh, again, this one was uh, checked out in a number of different uh, spots. And in addition, in the next slide, two slides, we did uh, both the SEM and the scanning Loge maps of silver, sodium, oxygen, and carbon. Particularly noteworthy is silver and sodium, and as you can see in the fresh state of this polycrystalline silver, silver uh, sodium is very evenly uh, distributed in uh, the uh, map. <coughs> Next one. Uh, this is the one where I showed you the uh, line scans to be uh, uh, not matching with the intensity and hence aggregated. Indeed, in the sodium map, and uh, uh, at least three of those spots, uh, as best as we could uh, resolve these from our old uh, uh, report, uh, they're very intense, uh, several hundred angstrom to thousand angstrom size uh, sodium aggregate particles. At that point, then, we indeed uh, zeroed in on these uh, bright sodium particles and by OG analysis, indeed convinced ourselves that they were entirely rich in sodium. This work with the pure polycrystalline uh, promoted uh, by sodium points to promoter aggregation as the dominant mechanism for selectivity aging uh, when aged in the absence of gas phase chloride promoter. And now I'd like to turn to the next topic um, in ethylene epoxidation, and that is the study of uh, mixed alkali promoter synergism in selective oxidation. At the uh, last International Congress on Catalysis in uh, Budapest, uh, we presented our results uh, on the synergistic improvement of efficiency in silver catalysts containing mixtures of cesium with other alkali. In the next slide, <clears throat> I hate to give these long tables, but uh, please concentrate only on the bottom three. They carry all the message. That is two. E, F, and G, that's the only ones I'm going to cover, which will tell you the, some of the most striking examples of uh, uh, promoter synergism. The bottom catalyst, 2G, containing 0.03 weight percent cesium and uh, no other promoter, <coughs> is totally inactive. The optimum amounts for this system is a 0.01 to 0.015 percent. So when you go to twice the concentration, they are totally inactive. 
However, the addition of 0.03% uh, lithium, and that's the lithium by itself is the uh, next one in white, 2F. It's uh, very inefficient, though active as a, uh, in fact, it's no more efficient than silver by itself. But when you add the 0.03 weight percent, and that is a lot of atom concentration, uh, I'm sure you recognize, the efficiency is as high as some of the best of the mixed alkali promoter system of 78.6%. So you'll see from this data that lithium, though by itself, is not a desirable promoter, that when added to a uh, cesium containing catalyst, which is dead, it makes it uh, perform as well as uh, some of the best catalysts in the mixed alkali system. Next slide. <clears throat> now I'd like to capture the highlights of the cesium-potassium synergism work and show you where the mixed cesium-potassium system uh, not only performs better than cesium or potassium, but has the, uh, the, uh, the best of both features as well as higher efficiency by over 1%. And uh, by the way, that, that uh, in the multi-billion dollar ethylene oxide FICO business is a lot of money. Uh, this was, uh, as we presented, uh, based on a very large uh, statistically designed set of experiments. And uh, our confidence uh, in those predicted lines is within 0.1% in efficiency, which is better than uh, the standard deviation of a single measurement. But I share with you the, uh, uh, the performance of the cesium-potassium and the cesium-potassium mixture. On the left is uh, cesium-only catalyst, which gives an efficiency of 75.5% at a total alkali content uh, a little below one gram equivalent weight per kilogram of catalyst. And also, you can see a very sharp optimum. Potassium, on the other hand, has a very broad efficiency maximum around 74%. However, you will note the mixtures of cesium and potassium have an efficiency that is higher than the best the cesium can do, which is by itself the best alkali promoter individually. The efficiency for the uh, cesium-potassium mixture, as you can see, is uh, not only higher by a percent, but uh, broad in response to alkaline. And as you can imagine, a broad optimum is more desirable than a very sharp, narrow optimum. This is uh, indeed an added beneficial feature of the mixed alkaline system. Now, the uh, Questions I couldn't answer at the Budapest uh, Congress, uh, uh, International Congress, I would uh, attempt to do that today. That is the mechanism of synergistic alkali promotion. I'll share with you the uh, likely cause or causes. In the next slide, I have uh, a pictorial demonstration of uh, alpha alumina support on which you have silver and cesium and potassium promoters. It's uh, certainly a simplified sketch, but uh, I certainly beat uh, showing you uh, uh, 10 slides. I'm sure you can all appreciate that. We don't want to be here past coffee hour. Uh, in this simplified sketch, that uh, you can see that cesium potassium uh, can be on silver surface and they can be on the support surface as they are uh, manufactured and put together. And when they are on the support surface, they can also be in atomic form, which is in white, and or aggregate form, which is in yellow. Potassium, uh, 
it is also able to go subsurface of uh, silver, while cesium essentially stays on top of uh, silver. Uh, I'd like to summarize that through extensive uh, labeled uh, kinetic studies and uh, high resolution Auger studies, we have shown that cesium is essentially atomically dispersed on silver and is better than potassium in reducing ethylene oxide burning from this support, especially in larger concentration uh, that uh, it can accommodate. Cesium and potassium uh, are present in uh, aggregates which can be as high as uh, from atomic to several tens to hundreds of angstrom. Thus the mixture of potassium and cesium has the advantage of both uh, these inhibitor and promoter type of action. This is quite consistent with the work of uh, Professor Lambert where he has shown that the bulky cesium sits on top of silver atoms uh, in single crystal studies, while the potassium, smaller cation, can go indeed subsurface. This leaves surface sites available on a potassium promoted catalyst more so than on a cesium promoted silver catalyst. We believe that uh, likely both mechanisms are operating and in a manner that the mixed uh, alkali synergistic catalyst is hence better than the best of the individual promoter cesium. Rubidium, cesium, and lithium behave uh, quite similarly, uh, although at uh, different concentrations and to different degrees of effectiveness. Next, I would like to uh, cover the uh, other last topic, and that is the uh, mechanistic efficiency limit that has been proposed over the years uh, that uh, belongs to my friend here, uh, Sackler and Kilty uh, from our uh, Shell organization. And of course, others have uh, contributed. This should come as a no surprise to folks working in ethylene oxide catalysis. However, I've been frequently asked the question uh, regarding the mechanistic limit, and all I could say was yes. Today, uh, we're willing to go beyond the answer, simple answer yes, <clears throat> to highlighting the role of surface science and fundamentals in uh, removing this uh, efficiency limit that was proposed nearly two decades ago. I didn't realize that uh, well, uh, it's been that long. <clears throat> you may be somewhat surprised to hear that uh, uh, we had uh, a similar mechanistic proposal in-house as well by uh, Young and uh, co-workers. And uh, so uh, good minds think alike. In, in this uh, mechanism, uh, I'll go over very quickly, the uh, dissociative adsorption can lead to O double minus adsorbed species, while the non-dissociative could lead to O2 single minus species. And it's the O2 single minus species that lead to epoxide formation, and the uh, uh, O double minus species efficiency is much higher, in fact, as higher as uh, 90 to 95 percent at, at significant rates. The next slide is uh, indeed uh, now going to the, back to my theme of how the surface science and fundamentals uh, help in uh, removing this uh, efficiency limit. Early on, um, Professor Bell, Alex Bell, and uh, Lambert and others had proposed monoatomic oxygen as being able to do both synthesis and the combustion of uh, ethylene or ethylene oxide. 
Hence, uh, very simply, if one can poison the undesirable oxygens, uh, you should be able to theoretically reach 100% efficiency uh, for this reaction. So that's uh, certainly uh, a way of doing it. Next slide. Another way of uh, being able to do the same, uh, remove the same kind of efficiency limit, even believing in the O2 uh, single minus as the selective and O double minus as the non-selective, is if the uh, rate of conversion of uh, the uh, O double minus or monoatomic oxygen to diatomic oxygen is so rapid that essentially O2 single minus dominates the surface. And uh, finally, I'd like to uh, clarify that at times I was certainly very disturbed when uh, many technologists lost sight of the fact that it is a mechanistic limit and incorrectly started to advocate it as a theoretical limit, which it is not. Hence, uh, surface science and fundamental studies have played an important role in exceeding the 85.7% efficiency limit. You've all been very patient, uh, ready to close. In summary, I'd like to capture the, uh, the few following thoughts that I've shared with you in the last uh, 30, 40 minutes. Heterogeneous catalysis has evolved into much more of a science than the art it used to be only a couple of decades ago. And this has been made possible through the application of surface science and fundamental characterization studies. Number two, the early development of surface science that had its origin in the late 60s, early 70s, was key to quick diagnosis of the cause and or causes of catalyst performance in fresh as well as used, abused catalysts. This indeed resulted in very quick payout for many industrial catalysts. Surface science studies of fresh and reactor use catalysts were responsible for the discovery of novel rhodium, iron, and rhodium manganese catalyst systems for the uh, synthesis gas reaction for C2 chemicals. Number four, surface science characterization techniques were key to understanding some of the catalyst aging process. And uh, five, the use of surface science techniques in combination with kinetic studies enhanced the quality and of the information obtained and certainly these uh, studies contributed to the discovery of and understanding of synergistic action of mixed alkali promoters as well as in removing the 85.7% 7, efficiency limit of a mechanistic proposal. Finally, in conclusion, I believe uh, very sincerely surface science and other new techniques, some in its infancy, some yet to be developed, shall play an even greater role in the discovery and development of novel catalysts and catalytic processes for the many industrial and environmental challenges facing the scientific community and the world as we try to make our planet Earth a better, healthier, and a safer place to live for centuries and generations to come. Indeed, this is what responsible care in our chemical industry is all about, and all of us at Union Carbide are committed to it. Many thanks to all of you for your kind attention. It's time for...